Hey everybody, welcome to this week's podcast, the first of 2022. I am very excited to roll out a bunch of very big and very cool changes to retro RGB throughout the year, and I hope that they're all changes for the better and there are ways that we could all kind of grow together in the retro gaming community. But not today. Today is just a normal podcast, so let's jump in and see what we got for the first of 2022. First up is something fun and lighthearted and silly. Steve from Dutch Island Games just sent over a one-level mini NES cartridge and provided a free ROM for everybody. That's basically my opening that Kenji wrote for me a few years ago, and I just thought it was so much fun and absolutely hilarious to see. So it all started because I got an, a random email from Steve saying, hey, do you have a P.O. box I could send you something to? You know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to send something over for you to take a look at. And I, as always, am brutally honest in that Thank you very much for the offer, but I have no time at all, so there's an excellent chance that whatever you send is going to sit in a corner for a month at least until I can get to it, so I just I don't want to waste your time or any of your stuff, and he was like, no, no, it's totally cool, this is just a fun thing, don't worry about it, so I picked it up, I opened the box just to see what it was, and as soon as I opened the box, I went, oh, cool, this is not at all what I expected. So I asked Steve if he wouldn't mind jumping on a live stream and do a real live unboxing. So that was all legit. When I did this video, all I saw at that point was just the cover of the cartridge and nothing else, uh, or not the cover of the box, not the cartridge. So this was a live in-person unveiling of this. And, uh, and then I showed the game itself here, which was, you know, not so much a game and it's just like it's you're playing the opening that Kenji wrote. So he took Kenji's artwork. Um, he worked with um, a musician, Cosmic Gem 829. I wanted to make sure I got that shout out. Uh, and just wanted to use this as an experiment for making NES games. I believe it was done on Nestmaker. Uh, so it just, you know, it's one of those things where I thought it was awesome and fun. It's not a game, so don't think it's something where I could like fight the evil Voltar as the main boss or something like that. You know, Voltar who's who's trying to drag down our land with lag or something I don't know maybe someday it would be fun to see something like that but this is just a silly and hilarious way of basically just playing my opening and I, I, the music the the theme song that I wrote years ago back in 2014 was reported over to this I mean it was just there was such a cool thing and such a nice gesture and I appreciated it so much and I also laughed so hard when I looked at the cartridge that he used and it was properly beveled <laughs> Because all I can think about is all the poor people who pre-ordered a hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollar special edition, you know, you know, from all those fancy places these days, and just got like a square edged thing that's probably going to slowly destroy your consoles. So the fact that this was a fun and silly one-off that still had a beveled edge absolutely cracked me up. So. If you would like to play this, uh, it's and the NES ROM is available for free right from the Dutch Island website. And uh, also, I would recommend looking at the PDF of the manual because that made me laugh out loud too. So thank you so much to Steve for doing this. This was absolutely hilarious and wonderful. And I just, seeing seeing the, the very funny avatar that Kenji created you know, all those years ago when I started the weekly roundup, um, just being turned into a little level of a game like this just made me smile so much. So thank you very much to Steve. Thanks to everybody that watches this. I, I can't tell you how much I always appreciate seeing the hits and seeing likes and stuff. And it's just, um, you know, I'm always incredibly grateful to be a part of all of this stuff. And I hope I never come across as anything other than that because, you know, while we're all human and we all get frustrated sometimes, I'm very, very happy to be here. And I just appreciate all of you so much. So I'm just a coincidence that I opened up the first podcast of the year with something so lighthearted, but I'm very, very glad I got a chance to. So thank you to everybody and feel free to check out the NES ROM if you'd like, just for fun. Crix has just released a new firmware for the EverDrive Game Boy X series, and the changes are listed as system changes required for carts with FPGA Core version 6 or later, and minor bug fixes. Now, I don't know this, I'm about to just guess, so please don't take this as truth, this is just a wild guess, but I think this probably has to do with people that may have been having issues with the analog pocket. So this is one of the rare moments where I would say that if your EverDrive Game Boy X series is working totally fine in any scenario, just leave it alone for now and, and wait to see where this goes. But if you do have one of the EverDrive X series that seems to be having issues with the analog pocket, give this a try. Now. 
Once again, that was a total guess. I have no idea if that's true or not, but I feel like it's a safe bet, and uh, I feel like Crix is just trying his best to work around anybody who might be having issues with it. Because not everybody is having issues with the analog pocket. And some people were having things where like you could load a ROM and if you turn it off and back on again, if you hit start to reload the ROM, it wouldn't work. But if you went back through the menu and reloaded it, it would. So I'm not really sure what the issue is, but it seems fixable. So if that is why this firmware update was released, give it a shot and see. Uh, and you know, if you have time, post in the comments and let people know what your experience is. If not, I'm sure there's plenty of people on the Crix forum and probably in discords everywhere that are talking about this. So, you know, as always, I'm super appreciative to Crix for always putting out these firmware updates and adding everything from bug fixes and trying to add compatibility for everything out there to huge and awesome new features. So thanks to Crix for doing this. And if you're having a buggy EverDrive X series on an analog pocket, cross your fingers and see if this helps. Dan Mons has just released a new set of calibration tools, as well as a video to go along and teach you how to use them for use in calibrating standard definition CRTs. So this does get a bit complicated, and this is really something that I don't think a beginner could just dive right into. You're probably going to want to watch Dan's other videos that he did about calibration and how it works on CRTs, and you're probably going to want to pick up one of the list of calibration tools that he, um, that he determined were good for CRTs and still available in those videos. But this is one of those things where if you do want to get around to calibrating your TV, stuff like this is incredibly important. And all you would really need is first train yourself how to use it, which is always the hardest part, but then download the software that Dan created, burn it to a DVD. And if you have a PlayStation 2, apparently that's one of the best devices that you could use for this. And uh, not only because, but one of the main reasons is because it does output composite S video and component. So while you would always want to calibrate to the highest quality signal your monitor accepts, if you have one of those cool PVMs that you could often find fairly cheap that are only S video and composite, at least you could now still calibrate it with S video. Um, I was a big fan of Dan's other videos. I watched all of them and I'm not going to lie. I had to watch them at least twice because I still don't quite grasp everything he's doing. But that's the good thing about Dan's videos is you don't really need to understand the why as much as the how. And as long as you have some patience, you should be able to do it. Now, I definitely want to put it, this out there that if you have a CRT that you like doing basic geometry calibration, I mean, just making sure that it fills up the screen in all directions and making sure that it's not too bright or not too dark is all most people would probably need if they just wanted to have a casual CRT experience. But if you are one of those people that really likes to see you know, the best color calibration and you like to see everything represented properly, definitely check out all of Dan's videos on this stuff as well as this post. And now you'll have a slightly easier way to accomplish all of that mixed with things like the monoscope pattern from the 240p test suite and all of the other tools that are available. So just a big thank you to Dan and everybody that works on stuff like this, because while not all of us want to go to those crazy lengths to calibrate CRTs, many of us do. And stuff like this is really crucial to getting that to happen. Analog has just released a minor firmware update to the Pocket handheld console that focus on some of the bugs that the reviewers found. Things like the noise channel fix for Shantae that Modern Vintage Gamer stumbled across, all of the pitch issues that MD Fourier found, and even the display modes for Game Boy Advance that My Life in Gaming found. So overall, I just I think this is really positive because I know a lot of people were waiting for the version 1.1 update that added a bunch of features that were initially advertised as shipping with this. But I'm always patient with things like this because, you know, Analog does an amazing job presenting themselves as a big company, but they're a small company and it's really hard to accomplish all of the stuff. So I have zero negative things to say about them releasing it with, you know, I don't want to call it a beta firmware because it mostly worked fine, but, you know, releasing it with not every feature that they promised and having that coming as a free software update in the future. Assuming it's free, all of their firmware updates always have been, so there's no reason to believe not to. So I just think this is overall as positive as you could get. Their team is listening. They're fixing bugs that some people may have deemed irrelevant, even though you know a lot of other of us do think they're very relevant. It wasn't a discussion. They just fixed it, which I think is absolutely awesome. So um, you know, stay tuned for the 1.1 update. Uh, if you have one of these, I guess I would definitely update it to this anyway, just to make sure that everything's working the way you hoped and some of the little things are a little bit smoother. 
And there's also no word on a jailbreak. And my gut's telling me that there will not be one because their marketing kind of presented the pocket uh it kind of like is a middle finger in the air to the Ambernic consoles. Like, we're not some crappy software emulation ROM thing. We use real games, which, you know, Analog is always um, very particular with their marketing. So maybe that was just a way to uh, stick the middle finger up at some of those very low quality software emulation solutions. Not all software emulations low quality, but the ones, some of the ones I'm referring to certainly are. Uh, so maybe that's it. Um, and maybe they're going to say no ROMs at all because we're going to take this stance as the original cartridge consoles. And I get mixed feelings about that because I do definitely think people buy analog consoles who want to use original carts. And I, I love that. I have zero negative things to say about that. But when it comes to something like the pocket, th you know, there really aren't any alternatives for portable handheld stuff like this that perform in the same league. And one of the main things about portables that would make it hard is if you had to carry a bag with a big giant bundle of games in it with you whenever you're traveling. So with handhelds, this would be a scenario in which you would buy, even if you were a giant fan of the Mister, you would still probably want to buy the Pocket, load it up with your ROMs, even if you have a wall of games that you love to play, and that way you could use it the way it was designed, as a handheld. I don't think that's going to happen, though. I think uh, they're going to double down on their marketing and, and try to make it, you know, the the cartridge only console, and you know, try to stick it to everybody that way. But hey, let's cross our fingers. Maybe Chris will release the jailbreak just to spite me because I said it in this. I'm alright with it. I love taking one for the team. Porkchop Express, who runs MrAddons.com, just posted another very helpful analysis, this time focusing on loading times for ROMs over different storage mediums. And some of the results were expected, but I'm glad that there's some actual data to back it up. And there was one pretty surprising thing, which I'll talk more about later on. But basically, if you load ROMs off of a micro SD card, the main one that you use for the DE10, or a USB hard drive, you're going to get about the same performance, which is very good. Now, I think most people are probably using micro SD just because it's easier because, you know, you have everything contained all in one package. However, it's not good to just constantly be ejecting that micro SD card. There's been some reports of that micro SD thing breaking so it doesn't retain the card in, which that stinks because then you're going to have to try to get that replaced on your DE10. And of course, if you just want to put you know, full ROM sets on something so that you have access to everything whenever you want to play it, it's going to be a lot more expensive to buy a large micro SD versus just a large SSD or hard drive. So knowing that is a good tip. Um, and I think that'll probably hold everybody off for the short term, or if you already have a solution like that, that you've implemented, that's pretty cool. The only thing I'll add to that is because of the way the Mr.'s USB ports work and the USB bus works, you don't really get any performance difference from like a mechanical spinning slow hard drive all the way up to an MVME SSD, which is lightning fast. They're all about the same. So my suggestion is always first and foremost, if you have something laying around that you could use, use that. But if you're going to go out and buy something, maybe think about an SSD for a couple of reasons. Even though you're not going to get a speed boost, it's not going to draw as much power, it's not going to create as much heat, and you could always repurpose that for a million other things when you're done with it that would be up to speed with modern devices. So if you have the budget for that, an external SSD would be fine. If you don't, or if you just want the biggest storage available today, one of those three and a half inch mechanical spinning drives with its own power supply is a really good choice. The only thing that I've had issues with is spinning drives that are powered by the USB bus often draw too much power for a standard mistered setup. So you would have to figure out a different way to power that, which some drives that's easy and other drives that could be a pain. Uh, I've seen certain Y cables that split the power and the signal from USB, so you could do it that way, but just wanted to put that out there. And of course, I certainly wouldn't waste any money on something like a, a crazy, you know, NVMe drive if you're not going to get any speed boost. You could, of course, get something like these. Uh, they're SSDs over USB, so that might be cheaper and helpful. So you'll get the speed increase when you're transferring ROMs from your PC to this, but it's still a low power device that could just go right into the USB port. So basically the standard. Now, this, where it gets surprising is loading ROMs over the network.
And of course, Wi-Fi was dependent upon your connection, the speed of your Wi-Fi, your interference, and you could potentially get speed as fast as a micro SD card. But anybody that's ever worked in IT or anything with computers knows that you don't rely on Wi-Fi unless you have to. Now that's in the context of things like loading ROMs. If you're just using it for your update all script and stuff like that, it's a perfectly good solution. And it's what I use most of the time, especially on the mini Mr. Cade back there, because uh, I don't have that. Um, I don't have an ethernet cable hanging off of that. So it's totally fine for that. But for loading over the network, I wouldn't recommend Wi-Fi unless it's a situation where you can't get a network uh, jack up to it. Or of course, you know, if it's something like that one where you would really want more of a mobile arcade machine where all you need is to plug it into the wall, then that would work perfectly as well. But the really cool part is loading ROMs off of the ethernet. So that means a uh, hardwired ethernet cable plugged into the mister, which is connecting to a local area wired network with a wired network attached storage share. That gets double the loading speed, if not more than every other method. And this was complete coincidence that Pork put out this, uh, this analysis because we're actually working on a project that allows easier sharing of ROMs across your local network for this exact reason. And I, I give you my word that this was not some coordinated effort. I laughed out loud when I saw Pork's analysis because I was hoping to do something like this once we got this up and running. So uh, while I don't want to say too much until it's ready, which it looks like definitely by the end of the month, you know, I've said that before, but... Um, there is something coming. So if you have a mister and you already have a solid storage solution, you're cool. But if you have a mister and you are about to invest in something, give us a week or two because there is a new thing coming out that I think a lot of people would be interested in. And as long as you have a good five gig network, wireless network, um, and it's not imperative that you have the, the highest speed, which it probably wouldn't be, you could do it over wireless, but I think everything over Ethernet, if you're in a spot to do that, is really going to be an awesome choice. And I think people are going to be really impressed with the things that we've been working on. And by we, it's mostly not me. I'm just kind of hanging out, helping where I can. But I will be the one that, uh, that shares it as soon as it hits official beta. And I'm very excited to talk about it. So I'm sorry for all the teasers, but I just I wanted to talk about this immediately because Pork already put it out. And we we're not quite ready to talk about the other thing but we will very soon. So if basically if you're a fan of the mister, it's a really good time to be a fan of one because there's so much cool stuff coming out for it. So I'll follow up in a week or two on this other thing that I'm teasing. Once again, sorry to do the dirty tease thing, but um, I think everybody's going to be pretty happy. But once again, if you just have a micro SD card or a USB stick or something like that, it's a great way to load ROMs and uh, you don't really have to worry about anything. And as always, only use Wi-Fi if you have to or if it's just for basic updates because anybody that's ever lived in a city and has dealt with wireless interference doesn't need me to explain anymore. If you're lucky enough to live out in the you know rural middle of nowhere, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about because wireless has always worked flawlessly for you. Uh, but the rest of us, the rest of us are all nodding our heads like, yes, we've been there. So I'll follow up soon with info on everything else. Hidden Palace just released 178 prototype game builds, 30 of which are from games that never saw a commercial release. So um, just first of all, a huge shout out to Hidden Palace for always staying on top of stuff like this. Um, you know, I, sometimes the stuff they find is neat if you are a big fan of that game, but other times like this, it's just really interesting for anybody that's into video game history or just wants a glimpse into what could have been but never was type of thing. So, you know, I always love reading through stuff like this, and there's just so much to talk about that I would strongly recommend just going through the links, uh, skimming through Alex's post, and just going through and reading all of the games that are up there and which ones are they and what the differences are between them. And I just, you know, like I just said, if it's something like a, an unreleased version of a beta of Sonic the Hedgehog and you're not really into Sonic, you might think, oh, cool, you know, thanks for mentioning it in the roundup. But 
on the flip side, if you scroll through these and you go, holy crap, you know, I would love to have seen what Madden football for Game Boy would have been like, you know, that could be a big deal for some people. So I love that Hidden Palace treats it all as equally important. Um, and it's all written up here in Alex's post if you want more info. And of course, the details are all right on their site. So a very cool find for video game preservation. Uh, and, you know, thanks to everybody who's involved in this stuff for making it happen. I just posted an interview with Ed, who runs the YouTube channel Space Invader One, that focuses on the network attached storage software called Unraid. And while this probably is going to sound like an IT nerd focused thing, and it is, it does 100% apply to retro gamers for so many different reasons. Um, I'm going to skim through some of the stuff that we talked about, and it's probably going to make people go, wait, what the hell are you talking about? But most of it's answered in this video, and there will be follow-ups that go into detail. But basically, Unraid is something that you load on a USB stick, you plug it into a PC, and it turns that into a Linux-based network-attached storage device, NAS device for your network. And the very basic use of Unraid can be accomplished in many different ways, but it's basically just easy network storage. Unraid is free to try. It's fairly cheap to purchase considering all of the other options, but there are a few things that really make Unraid stand out from the rest. The first thing, which applies to everybody in all of its uses, is that you can stick in any hard drive and any combination of hard drives. So any IT people out there already know what I'm talking about, uh, but for the rest of us casual nerds, when you use a RAID array, a box or a server where you stick a bunch of drives in, so if you have four 10 terabytes, now you have a 140 terabyte array, all of those drives need to be identical, same size, and really should be the same manufacturer. And if you're in the corporate world, you probably would all get you know a big batch of off the same run of manufacturing just to keep everything equal. And Unraid is the opposite. You could throw in a two terabyte drive. You could throw in a 500 gigabyte SSD. You could throw in an 18 terabyte drive and it would basically make it a 20.5 terabyte RAID array. And RAID meaning it copies the data across all of it. And the other really cool feature about Unraid is it stores the data in a way where if everything dies, all of that data is still readable in a Linux machine. So unlike RAID arrays where if your main board dies, you probably can't get that data back. Now, in the corporate world, that doesn't really matter because you're going to have a backup of the backup. Any IT person worth a shit would have done that anyway. But at home, it's different, right? So you might use this as your backup. You might back this up to something else. But it's a lot harder when things go down uh, to, to pick up from that. And you don't have all of this access to equipment where you could say, oh, grab one of the backup boxes and you know come back and, and throw that in here. You're really stuck with all of the stuff that you have which is what makes things like this cool. And there are other ways to do it. There are absolutely other methods to doing exactly what I just described, but I like Unraid for a few other reasons as well. And a lot of it has to do with the features, the plugins, and the community around it. So you could also turn whatever device this is into a virtual machine host. And Ed talks a bit about using this to, uh, to make things like Windows XP VMs, you know, classic computer VMs. And he even mixed the real hardware from classic computers using the VM just to emulate the CPU. Very cool stuff. We kind of go in pretty deep. So while, of course, you could just load up a VM on a virtual machine, which is, you know, a software version of a PC on a PC, you could load that up on anything. But having it all in one location so that you could pick it up off of anything that you're using is a pretty cool uh, advantage to that. But the other thing that I liked about Unraid is the community applications that you could add to it. So that thing that I teased before when I was talking about Quark's Mr. Data analysis, that will probably end up on, on Unraid as well for a, a way to centralize your ROMs on one spot. And Ed's already done work with streaming ROMs to a PlayStation 3, but there's a lot of other stuff that you could do with it. So my suggestion to you, if you're even remotely interested in this stuff, any one of the aspects I just talked about is listen to this interview to familiar, familiarize yourself with it. If you're an IT nerd and you want to mess around with it, I love that you could just take any PC you have, unplug the hard drives that are in there just to be safe, fire up a USB stick with a free trial, and then load up any one drive and just kind of get started and see if you like it or not. And if you're not an IT nerd and this stuff would be a pain, 
hang on a little longer and see if the other project that we're uh, that I'm, I'm t- been teasing throughout this entire podcast, when that comes out, then kind of listen to whatever we talk about there and see how this all applies to you. Some people, like me, will absolutely want to go an unraid solution for everything. You could repurpose an old PC, you could repurpose old drives. There's so many different ways that you could get one of these running for, I mean, if you're a computer nerd, possibly free because of stuff you probably have piled up in your basement. Um, But other people might still be super into it and they just don't want to use Unraid. They could use the simpler version that we're working on. But either way, I just, I really wanted to talk to Ed now to get everybody, um, you know, everybody up to speed who's into this to, to get you familiarized with it. So that way, hopefully by the end of this month, when we have more news on the other retro gaming focused version of this stuff, that you'll have the knowledge to jump in and say, yes, this is for me or, hey, cool, but I don't really care is always fine. Never a problem with that. So, you know, please check out Ed's channel. Please subscribe to him on YouTube if you're into this stuff at all, because I found out about Unraid from Risha, who uh, pushed me to get into it. And man, was she right, by the way. (laughs) But uh, it was really Ed's channel that got it going and bugging her for Linux commands when I wanted to do some of the weirder stuff. But if you're able to just go through his videos and watch whatever you're looking to do, most of the stuff that you want to do is already there and you already have the ability to just watch the tutorials and go right through it. So it was very cool talking to him. I'm definitely going to be doing a follow-up at some point, probably this year. And uh, I just, I think that there are so many of my fellow nerds that listen to this that I think this is actually going to be a pretty popular interview. And I think people are going to really benefit from using stuff like this. Because, you know, as with all of the things I talk about, you could very well start to research on Raid and go, this is cool, but... I want something different, but you might not have known about it if you didn't listen to Ed talk about it in the first place. So I'll quit rambling about it, check out the interview, but I'm really happy uh, how this one came out. And I'm really excited to see all of the crazy different things I'll be able to do with VMs and streaming and capture. And of course, ROM hosting and distribution throughout your house, your local network. Retro Gamer Store has just opened up pre-orders on clear NES shells. This is for the front-loading NES, the classic look of the ones that you've seen in North America, and I'm very excited for this. There are a few things to note. First of all, this is an early bird pre-order where they're being sold at a discount, and it's basically just to make sure the project gets funded. So Retro Gamer Store takes a bit of a loss, but hopefully gets more people enticed to buy it right away so that they could get funding to pay for the incredibly expensive tooling that something like this costs uh, and requires. And then it'll change in the future. So I ordered the moment I got word that they were up and it cost $125 after shipping to the US. I'm not sure if it's going to be slightly different shipping costs to different places around the world. Um, And that should ship around April. I would think spring would probably be a safe bet. And I think it's absolutely awesome that it's available. Now, there's more good news though. After the pre-orders are over and once these are just in stock at regular stores, there also will be an option to order just the top or just the or the full kit including top and bottom and all of them will come with new screws so both of those are great because i've had a few older screws break on me when i was trying to use these and also on top of that most nes's i've seen are missing at least a screw or two uh, which is funny but it just kind of is what it is so that's good news but i've also seen an equal amount of people with completely beat up old nesses as i have with people that have the bottom shells that are flawless and the top shells that are you know yellowed or cracked in the corners and stuff like that so it's cool that we'll eventually get an option to buy either the full kit or just the top Uh, I know I was very happy to buy the full kit because I have an NES that looks like Swiss cheese and back from all the different mods I'd tried over the years. It was before, it was one of the reasons that I I started to get pretty passionate about, about passionate about the no cut mod stuff. Cause I just saw that I basically had ruined an NES and I felt bad about it. So I'm going to be very pleased to finally not have to stare at that atrocity and have a, a nice, beautiful, clear looking NES on there. But Um, You know, if if you were the type of person that added the SNES multi out, you know, maybe you regretted it, maybe you don't, maybe you switched over to the real Phoenix's board that allows a no cut mod. Now you have options, Um, but either way, I think it's pretty cool. Also, I am pretty sure that the metal shielding on those front loading NES consoles aren't really necessary to prevent interference on any of the games. Now, I haven't done a detailed test yet. I will soon, probably when I get the case, but 
I think it's one of those things where you could leave that metal shielding off so that you'd be able to see the game in, you know, locked into the tray through the clear case, which would be very, very awesome. I don't think there's going to be any, any interference. There certainly isn't a safety issue. It would really just be, does this cause interference on the video or audio because it's not being shielded against outside sources? Does it cause interference if it's powered on next to another console without a shield? I'm pretty sure there's no worries whatsoever. Certainly nothing safety related. Um, and it's not like the PC engines where you need the shield in order for the grounds to connect. So I'm going to definitely try that out and see. But I have a feeling this is one of those things where it's just going to be a really cool addition to a lot of people's front loading NESs. But that's not it. Retro Gamer Store said they're also going to be working on just the top cover for Famicom shells, which is another cool thing because I know so many people that have good condition Famicoms with yellowed or cracked tops to them. And on top of that, the Famicoms have those really cool eject levers, so you'll be able to see that right through the top. Um, all of that stuff, the, the choice of top or full and the Famicom tops are going to be coming after the pre-orders are over. So if you are, you know, if you're on the fence or if you want one right away, I would definitely pre-order it right now. But if you're waiting for a Famicom, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer. And, you know, the only other thing that I have to just briefly mention this time, because I've beaten this point to death, is that you get what you pay for. This is an expensive case, and it is completely reasonable to say, I don't want to spend that much money on a replacement case. That is a perfectly reasonable opinion, and I would never look down on anybody for that. But it does kind of drive me insane when I hear people say, oh, that's a ripoff. Why are they more expensive than the console? They're, you know, that's highway robbery. And that's not it at all. To make tools to make this type of high quality plastic. And I have bought every one that Retro Game Restore made and they're all super high quality. To, in order to make those as high quality as they are, it requires a very expensive tool. And the only way to get the price down is to sell a ton of them. And as I've talked about before, unfortunately, these don't sell as much as, as everybody would have guessed or would have hoped. And partly is because of the price, but it's the chicken and egg thing, right? If Retro Gamer Store drops the price and doesn't sell 3,000 of them, they you know lose all their money, which is horrible and nobody wants that because we want to keep seeing more of these shells be made. So I totally understand if the price is too high for you, but it is a fair price and it is not a ripoff. Based on the quantity sold, these, these are exactly what you should be paying for it. And hopefully... We get so many orders that they're able to drop the price, uh, but that's not the case at the moment. So I just always want to clarify that when I talk about it, because there's always a group of people that, that assume this is some kind of taking advantage of the retro community, and it's, it's not. It's absolutely not. I would tell you if it was. I, I'm not a nice person sometimes. Sometimes you got to just tell things as they are and eat the shit that you get after you do, uh, and that's not the case. This is just one of those things where it's an expensive item, and if you feel like it's worth it, cool. And if you don't feel like it's worth it, that's fine too. Stika just posted a video about a 90s Brazilian TV show for kids called Play Game. And it's essentially the Brazilian version of Nick Arcade, which was sponsored by Sega via Tectoy. So if anybody doesn't know the history, basically the company Tectoy in Brazil had sold Sega products under their brand uh, pretty much the whole time and up until now, I believe. And they had sponsored this show, which, which was very similar to Nick Arcade in that it had kids on answering questions and then jumping in front of a green screen and putting themselves in a video game, which, you know, looking back, it's kind of funny to see how ridiculous it was, but it also must have been pretty incredible to be a kid and see yourself do that stuff long before people had home green screen setups for any, any streaming setup. And I really liked the video a lot. I, I thought it was just very fun to take a glimpse into something like this. And it was also really neat to hear how they were able to control the players on screen, to why the show didn't really continue, and to hear the history behind it. So this stuff uh, is always enjoyable to me. Uh, last year, Wrestling With Gaming did a documentary on Nick Arcade. Maybe it was two years ago. I don't know. All the times just blending together these days. But uh, check that out too if you want a, a full documentary on the history of Nick Arcade. And this is a great view into the Brazilian version of that, which I just thought was very cool. As usual, Stika just did a great job bringing things together. So uh, if you're interested, definitely check that one out. Well, that's it for this week. 
I've been kind of sick the past few days, so I had to record some of this on Monday and some of this on Tuesday, and then I had to re-record some stuff because I realized I made a few mistakes. And, uh, you know, I, I never mind making mistakes. We're all human. I always just try to admit that and move on, but I, uh, I make a lot more mistakes when I'm sick. So hopefully all of this stuff came out okay, um, and hopefully the intent came out okay as well. It was all positive stuff this week, so hopefully it felt that way when you were listening to it. But I just wanted to give everybody a heads up because uh, in case I was more off than usual, uh, at least you have an explanation as to why. Also wanted to shout out Steve from RetroTech. I bought one of his shirts from uh, his merch page, and this is a really comfy hoodie, and I like the PVM logo in the middle. So I wanted to wear that this week and just give a shout out. But anyway, thank you all who watch, listen, play nicely in the comments, and especially people who support in absolutely any way possible, because it is you who is keeping all of this alive. And uh, I really enjoy doing this, and I hope to continue to do this for a while, and I wouldn't be able to without all of you. So thank you all so much, and here's to a cool and hopefully better 2022.